Sorry. Yeah. So yeah, so please feel free to ask me questions. Barbara actually helped me to tailor this presentation to this uh, heterogeneous cl uh, crowd, but if you have any specific questions, feel free um, to ask me on the way, especially, I, I especially made sure not to cover too much of the theor theoretical aspects of my work, just to give you a flavor of the kind of work that I'm doing, so feel free to ask me anything you want. So as was mentioned, I'm working here with uh, Barbara and David Parks. Um, um, a little bit about me, I, I, I uh, mastered, I, I studied information system engineering, I did my master's and PhD at the Technion working on automated planning or different aspects of automated planning and artificial intelligence as, a, as a, the general uh, subject, but today when people say artificial intelligence, they usually mean data science oriented research. We consider ourselves in the automated planning community to be more old fashioned um, um, AI in the sense that we work with models and we try to produce policies and understand how uh, di the dynamics of systems can be used to produce efficient policies. So, um, in or before we actually dive into the details of what I actually do, I thought it would, could be nice to start with some motivating examples and examples that actually uh, fueled my research along the years. So the, uh, I, the first example is one from um, Scotland, uh, two th uh, uh, two th uh, 2009. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> to 1,000, well, the, 20, uh, the last century, uh, the Glan Cinema disaster. It's a famous example uh, w that is well studied by uh, 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 researchers of architecture. Um, this, the, what, it, um, what happened there was uh, a fire that erupted in a movie theater. And unfortunately, most of the people lost their lives. Now, the morning of the fire, there was a fire inspection that, um, of course, the cinema passed without any problem. Um, and researchers were trying to understand how come so many people lost their lives in that, uh, in that fire. And what they realized after, after doing this research is that the reason was that people were died while trying to escape. And people were pushing and shoving each other on the way out. And what researchers realized is that if there were a pole obstructing the exit, that pole would actually save most of the lives because it would, it would control the flow of people. So instead of pushing and shoving each other, it would have created order and saved most of the lives. So this is, a, I hope you agree, a, an example of how counterintuitive design examples would have been uh, very beneficial for, for people in that cinema. A second example comes from the world of uh, permaculture. Permaculture is what I like to view this as in the art of uh, complex ecosystems. And in permaculture, um, uh, we think of ways in which agents with different types of utilities, so agents that are it, interacting in a complex environment affect each other and benefit each other. So for example, permaculture can be applied to uh, your vegetable garden. Now if you guys plant, you, you think of your vegetable garden and you think of the vegetables you want to put, probably what you have in mind is a garden where uh, plants are uh, uh, sowed in, in rows, one row for the tomatoes, one row for the cucumbers, etc., etc. That's a big no in permaculture because what you're doing there is you're creating vulnerable environments. If you have a pest that is uh, attacking your cucumbers, it's going to kill your entire crop. What they do in permaculture instead is think of the interactions between these agents and think of ways to plant your vegetables in a way where each agent helps each other and is assisted by the other agents. So for example, we have the three sister principle where you take your corn, you take your squash, and you take your beans, but instead of planting them separately, you plant them together. The corn gives the beans a, play, uh, 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 a, a, a stock on which to grow. The squash covers the ground and prevents the water from evaporating. Not, I don't know if in Boston you have this problem, but in some countries you have a problem where you, 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 you put water on the ground and it, I, most of it evaporates, so this is a big deal. 
the beans provide the, nurture the soil with nitrogen that is very important for the plants. So it's, it's an interactive, and uh, interactive environment where agents help each other and are helped by others. So that's a se second example. A third example uh, is, is uh, the, garbage uh, the, the garbage cans. And I've been, uh, I, I, I've, I visited Ichikai in Melbourne 2017. And one of the things that I fa was fascinated by were their trash cans. So uh, in, then um, usually what you see when you see a trash can is something like this. This is, this is the Harvard Yard uh, trash can where you have a recycling uh, a bin for recycling, of course, but the other bin is either this guy putting his rubbish into the can, or you have trash, or you have waste. But what I saw in uh, Melbourne is that the, that, that container that contains the non-recyclable items is called landfill. Now, to me, that was a wow, landfill. If you throw your, your stuff here, it's going to fill the land. To me, that's a very subtle way to convince me to actually separate my garbage and think twice before I fill the land with my trash. So hopefully you uh, all agree that these are examples where the environment is redesigned without creating a, a big change to utility, so without compromising the e efficiency of the environment. Uh, what we call utility in our terms. And uh, we do this in a way, I mean, and, and thinking of these ways is not necessarily always, always very easy to, to come up with. So my research agenda in general is thinking of the ways, understanding the ways by which the design of the environments in which we operate affects our ability to benefit from them. And specifically, I'm interested in non-obtrusive changes, so minimal changes that do not affect the system usability, the preserved system usability, we, uh, um, uh, and, 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 and costing me the minimal, so the minimal change that is needed to create, uh, to, to create uh, an increase in usability. Now, I recently learned about uh, Thaler and Sunstein, the Nobel Prize, la uh, Prize laureates, that uh, came up with the notion of a nudge. I don't know if you guys know this book. It's an ex I, well, I, I, I'm now reading the book. It's an excellent book where they describe what they call a, a, a way to achieve what they call libertarian paternalism. Libertarian meaning that you preserve an agent's a, a freedom of choice while a, taking care, and this is the paternalism part, making sure that you are applying change that is beneficial for the agent. My research, admittingly, is not necessarily paternalistic, and as you, as you will see uh, soon why, but I'm very interested in the libertarian uh, aspect of, 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 of uh, change. So how do I preserve usability and still create a change that, I, uh, that uh, maximizes the utility measure that I set? So, as a general structure of how my research is, uh, is built, uh, I w I'm working on what I call utility maximizing design. This is a term that I coined recently to reflect the, the fact that I am, am interested in various ways of uh, defining a utility function and a setting and finding different ways to redesign these environments for maximized utility. As you will see, I'm very interested in the algorithmic approach of this, but I'm also very interested in finding new ways to define utility and new ways to define change. I almost completed my PhD when I realized that uh, David and uh, his student or her student Zhang, uh, I don't know if you guys uh, and, uh, knew that, and she, uh, they, uh, it's a student that was here, David uh, uh, Parks, uh, uh, they worked on um, a problem they called environment design where they formulated a language for redesigning environments exactly with the intention of maximize, maximizing some utility measures. So we are now generalizing this to different changes, not necessarily to the environment, but we can also change the agents, etc. cetera. But it, I was very happy when David agreed to uh, mentor me here because I thought it could be great to think about it together. But before I realized environment design actually exists, 
my PhD focused on what we call goal recognition design. How to design environment for maximizing the ability to understand what agents are trying to achieve. I'll, I'll, this will be the focus of this talk. I've also worked with uh, Shlomo Zilberstein and Luis Pineda from UMass on a, on a problem we call equi reward utility maximizing design, where the idea is to redesign an environment for the benefit of an agent. Lastly, and this is something I, I intend to engage here in, uh, when I, in, my, in my time in Harvard, is design for collaboration. Thinking of ways, of course I'm working with Barbara, so collaboration is something that she's very passionate about and I uh, think this can be lead to very interesting work. We are thinking of ways to create environments where collaboration is facilitated. So the utility is the collaboration. Not the, not the, uh, not the task, but the collaboration itself. And this is, this is just primary thoughts that we have on this matter, but I think it can lead us to very interesting directions. But as I said, today I'm going to focus on goal recognition design and the way we are extending it now, and I'll sh shortly tell you about equi reward utility maximizing design. So before I say that, I just want to give you kind of a flavor of the kind of research that I do. We formulate a design problem, we know what the modifications are, the, since I come from the planning community, well, the tools that I've been using for my, uh, for my work so far have come from the planning uh, community, the, that, the tools that they offer. So I uh, have formulated the design process as a search in the space of modification. And this is, a, this is an understanding that came after we did some work, and then we realized that we can actually profit from the fact that we can model our search as a search in the modification space. So here, are, here is our modification space, we search through it, and the nodes represent the different models that can be achieved. Okay, and we use automated planning techniques to both evaluate the value of a node, and search efficiently for an optimal sequence of modifications that will maximize utility. Now, David told me to be careful. When I talk of a sequence, I'm not necessarily, it's not a sequence over time. Well, the reason why I'm looking for a sequence is that uh, modifications can have a dynamic, they can have preconditions. We are just looking for a sequence to apply, uh, to apply that will not contradict each other and the utility uh, uh, the, the, the utility that we want to, uh, that according to which we measure our model is maximized. So, what the rest of the talk I will uh, cover briefly, um, and Barbara told me to do it briefly, but if you have questions, make sure to ask me. I will cover the background of automated planning and heuristic search. I'll tell you about goal recognition design, and then I'll cover uh, the other models that we are thinking about. So what is a planning problem? The, wor the world in which I operate is, or have operated so far is the world of planning where we have an initial state, we have a goal state, and we have a specification of the actions, the transitions that are possible in, this, in our world. We use a compact representation of the state space, uh, specifically we use strips, in order to represent our world. We have a set of Boolean propositions that represent the state of the world, and each, act, each action is represented by uh, the preconditions, add effect, and delete effects that move us from state to state. The solution uh, is a sequence of uh, actions that trans transform us from the initial state to the goal state, and typically, we are interested in a solution that minimizes the cost, okay? Or the sum of actions, that, that it really doesn't matter, the setting it can be cost, uniform cost or not, it doesn't matter. This is the basic setting. Of course, on top of that, we have a Markov decision processes with, which reflect uh, um, probabilistic actions. We have partial observability, which is reflected in partially observable Markov decision process processes, shortly known as POMDPs. We have, very, we, we have various ways to model these, uh, uh, these settings. Th what res when we, when we uh, model a problem, we uh, implicitly have a directed graph that represents our state space, our world. 
In theory, we could, of course, use Dijkstra or BFS if uniform cost is applied to find our solution, right? Exhaustively exploring the state base is, only, uh, is always the base solution. In practice, however, our, our problems are large. I gave this example of the map of, of, of Europe. You would not consider exploring it exhaustively. What we do is we uh, use techniques to uh, make our search more efficient. Now, a key issue that I want to mention here, and I think this is relevant to mention to this crowd, is the fact that our techniques that we apply are always domain independent, in the sense that we are interested in finding a solution for a set of problems. Once you can model your problem using our representation, or a presentation uh, uh, that is flexible to account for different settings, our solution would would apply to your problem. So domain independent is the key word. The, the techniques that we use, there are various techniques. Where I, when you have an exponential uh, state space, you, have, you need techniques to search efficiently. We have, well, there are various ways to do it. The ways, the ways uh, because my, oh sorry, because my research so far has focused on finding optimal solution, I have focused on two methods for uh, reducing the state space size. One is pruning where we ignore part of the search space. Safe pruning is, is pruning that is guaranteed that an optimal solution is not pruned. Okay? We are interested in safe pruning to make sure that an optimal solution is still found even though we prune the search tree. Heuristic is a related but different approach where we use estimations of the nodes, of the value of a node, to prioritize our node. My uh, uh, master's advisor, Carmel Dunschlag, used to call it a sense of smell. We want to develop a sense of smell to, that will lead us to our goal, right? So what we want is uh, estimation. We call this heuristic. And I know heuristics in, in, in some of your worlds means uh, uh, inaccurate. It's inaccurate, but here we use admissible estimation, so underestimate, that underestimate the cost to goal. And using those, using uh, uh, heuristic search al algorithms like ASTAR, guarantee optimal solutions. So we need to make sure that our estimate, estimations underestimate the cost to goal. And if they are easy to compute, we, are, we, can, we can find solution, optimal solutions more efficiently. So that was the background. Let me tell you what my work was. So um, uh, 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 and before I can tell you what goal recognition design is, I have to tell you what goal recognition is. So just to give you a flavor of the kind of work with the, that we're doing. So think of this as an airport where you have passengers that enter a building and they're either heading to a Terminal A or a Terminal B. Think of this as a mall where you, have where you have customers that are either buying clothes or food, right? We are working in a generic environment. Um, we observe these agents and we are trying to understand according to the observed behavior what their objective is. Now let make, let's make some assumptions to make this story clear and then we will relax these assumptions later on. But for now, for the sake of discussion, let's assume that the agent, ooh, sorry, let's assume that the agents are optimal. Optimal means that they, are, uh, they achieve their goal with minimal cost, so uh, they know how to do that. They are, the actions are deterministic. The environment is fully observable, both to the agent and the observer. And a uh, movement is only perpendicular, so only up, left, right, uh, down, okay? If under the assumptions that I told you, if I see an agent do this, right, walk into the building, move right, and then move up, according to the assumptions that we've just made, I know that the agent is heading to go to, right? So that is what we just did, where we are matching a behavior to a predefined uh, understanding of what a behavior to go to looks like. What we just did was goal recognition. My PhD, thought of a different way to approach this problem. Instead of ob analyzing an observation, what we thought of doing was analyze the environment in which uh, the agents operate. So we when we look at this environment, we ask ourselves, what, what happens with this agent in the center? Not only does she not reveal her goal to us, but she can actually wa walk all the way up to the wall without revealing her objective. This is what we call the worst case distinctiveness. 
This is the behavior that maximizes the agent's ability to conceal its objective, right? So, and this is the measure. Remember, we want a utility. This is the, this is the, system's uti the system utility. What we want to do is to minimize it, right? So we want to introduce change. Let's say we can build walls. One, one way to, uh, to achieve uh, perfect recognition abilities is to build this wall. We can build this corridor. When an agent enters the room, the first action that ta the agent takes will reveal its goal. I hope you can agree this is an effective solution, but this, is not, this does not preserve the system's usability. We, w we do not want to uh, operate in, uh, in environments where our, uh, when we have to walk into a corridor to reach our terminal. What we want to do is we want to think of ways to apply minimal change to achieve the same utility. So what we can do is we can uh, block a single action and I hope you can see why we believe that this translates in practice to many relevant changes that can be introduced to the environment. So you walk into this building, you have, the, you have this fountain, and you, your first action will reveal your objective. Okay, remember, not necessarily paternalistic. This is, this is what I mean. So our first work, uh, ICAPS 14, was accounting for agents that are optimal. And my PhD since then thought of ways to relax the assumptions that we made. So uh, the, the AAAI, our AAAI, AAAI 15 uh, uh, paper accounted for suboptimal agents, not assuming that agents have perfect knowledge of the environment, so they're suboptimal. Uh, uh, AAAI 16, each case 16, and ICAPS 18, we extended our models to account for environments that are only partially observable. So the uh, recognition system has a, a noisy sensor through which it observes agents and still needs to